Thank you to Pastors Chris and Lisa, our senior pastors, for trusting me with the word of God this morning. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty and glorious and wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word, God. We thank you, Lord, that it's living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, God, that you back your word, Lord, and that Holy Spirit, you are here this morning to teach us and to bring revelation and encouragement and truth from your word. Thank you, God, that in this country we are free to worship you. Thank you, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. The Holy Spirit has highlighted for us here at New Life um, for this year that we should look into the freedom that we have through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very important as believers that we understand that freedom, that we live that freedom, that we walk in that freedom. So Wednesday night, we wrapped up our connect groups here on a Wednesday night in which we did the Freedom in Christ course. And it was wonderful and very powerful and really ministered to people on a very deep level. At the same time, Pastor Chris has been teaching us in a series on the book of Galatians. Now, Galatians also deals with certain aspects of our freedom, and Pastor Chris has been teaching that. Then, interspersed with our Galatians series, we are running this series called Break Free, and Pastor Samuel Tarbe did the first message in the Break Free series, and it was called What's Holding You Back? If you want to go back on our website and just um, listen to that message. So today, we are going to look at a very important part um, where we we may be saved and we may have a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And when the time comes for us to be with Jesus, we will be with Jesus. But whilst here on earth, we might be experiencing oppression and bondage and things which God doesn't want us to experience. So we're going to look today at a very important part of, of our freedom, um, and that is the mind. The mind, what happens in our minds? Now, if I asked you to think about all the expressions and phrases that you know that deal with the mind, oh, there's so many, you know, there's mind blowing, there's out of sight, out of mind, there's mind over matter, there's mind boggling, there's mind games, there are just all these phrases that, that have the mind in them. So the mind indeed is a very important part of our being. Over history, there have been people, um, dictators, and you'll know them, who at various times have taken an ideology and indoctrinated people in their minds to behave in a certain way. And once that, that propaganda had settled in people's minds, they, they committed the most atrocious and horrendous things, but they were convinced in their minds by this ideology that, that that is what they must do. And so over history, there have been many examples like that. There are people who whose minds tell them that they are sick. Yet, clinically, doctors can find absolutely no reason or no evidence, no medical evidence for that. That's just how strong the mind can be. There are various wonderful and good things about the mind. It is um, proven that people who have a gratitude mindset, in other words, they think thoughts of gratitude, that they are happier and generally live more positive and healthier lives. Beautiful things come from the mind, creativity, ideas, plans, strategies, they are beautiful things that also um, come from the mind. So, um, 
you are I, you can talk in church so i'm going to ask a question and i hope that maybe i'll just give three people a chance and the one who's the closest after the service you can fetch your prize from mike how many thoughts on average per day do you think a human being has anybody i couldn't hear that 70,000, and what did you say, Veronese? 10,000. Okay, Brian, you can get your chocolate afterwards. It's actually 60,000 thoughts on average we have per day. That is a humongous number of thoughts. Not more than what God has towards us, because according to Psalm 139, God's thoughts toward us are more than the grains of sand at the sea. That is just a, a wonderful thing. But having said that, so we have got quite a number of thoughts, average number of thoughts per day. And is the mind bad per se? No, it's not. God created us as tripart beings, having three parts, a body, a soul, and a spirit. The mind, the will, and the emotions are part of the soul. So is the mind bad per se? Not at all. God intended that those three parts would function in harmony, would function as a whole, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, but I think he surely has in mind that it would be holy as well, H-O-L-Y, but God wants those three parts to function as a whole. And having said and knowing how powerful the mind can be and how many thoughts we have, it's worth our while as children of God to understand and to look into what does God have in mind for our minds, and we are going to do that. So now here's the thing. Our mind field, the field of our mind, the area of our mind can be a mind field if we allow that. Where do we find minds and mind fields? They found in battle zones. So we have to recognize that we are in a spiritual battle and that that battle is for our minds. And the enemy wants to come and plant minds in our minds, that's his thoughts and what he thinks, so that he can create a minefield in our minds as, as the way that he battles. Our minds are our spiritually most vulnerable parts, I'll say that again, our minds are our spiritually most vulnerable part. So if the enemy can succeed in planting a mind, a mind thought there, he ideally wants it to be detonated and to explode, and then he wants the shrapnel to go all over the place and to affect all areas of our lives, to affect our identity, to affect our self-worth, to affect our relationships, to af affect how we see God, to affect how we see ourselves. That's the idea, to plant those minds, they explode, and they have the shrapnel go into other areas um, of our lives. And as I mentioned with the example of where propaganda and indoctrination starts in the mind, with us, if a thought starts in our mind, what our thoughts give rise to our emotions and our emotions give rise to our behavior. So if the enemy can get to the mind, he will be able to affect emotions and to affect our behavior. The, the minds that the enemy wants to plant are lies and deception. And this is what Jesus said of the enemy in John 8, 44. 
He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. And in the message translation, it also puts it very nicely like this. He was a killer from the very start. He couldn't stand the truth because there wasn't a shred of truth in him. When the liar speaks, he makes it up out of his lying nature and fills the world around us and wants to fill, fill our mind with lies. So the strategy that the enemy has goes right back to the Garden of Eden when the Lord created Adam and Eve and then the enemy came along to Eve and what did he do? He didn't pull out a knife or a gun or I don't know in those days whatever a spear or anything like that. He started playing his mind games with Eve. Then he speaks to her and he says the following in Genesis 3, 1. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? This is a prime example of mind games. Because if the enemy went up to Eve and said, hi Eve, did God say you and Adam can eat of all of the trees in this garden? Then Eve can say, no, God said we can eat of every tree except the tree in the middle, the one who is the knowledge of good and evil. Clear answer. Now he comes with, his, with the word indeed. And some translations say, did God really say? So there goes, there goes the mind game. Eve, uh, yeah, what, what did God say? Did he say that? But why would he say that? Um, that's such a lovely tree. And here she goes, starting to doubt, starting to get confused about the truth of what God had told them. So what the enemy wanted to do before he could defeat Eve and before he can defeat us, he must first come to disobey arm us by trying to get us to question the truth so that the lie can be planted. Um, so he will have the same MO with us because once we take the first lie, then the deception starts and then he will bring more and more of the lies of the minds to plant them in our mind field. So Eve allowed the enemy to plant that mine. As you know, it detonated and it, it affected their lives in a major way. And the effect is still in the world and continues to be in the world because of that mine that um, Eve um, allowed to the enemy to put there. But a part of all the wonderful and glorious and amazing things that our Savior Jesus Christ did for us is that He set our minds free. And it reads like this in John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And some translations will set you free. Adam and Eve had been told by God the truth from God what they needed to know. You and I, we have the word of God. That is the truth. So we know what we need to know, what God is saying, what is true from God's word. And over and above that, I think it's just so amazing that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us and that the word says he guides us into all all truth. Not only do we have the truth of God's word, we have the Holy Spirit as a counselor, as one with us who guides us into all truth. Now the, the different thing, but encouraging and awesome and amazing about this spiritual battle that we have is that the sure and firm thing is that the outcome 
of that battle has already been determined. Jesus is victorious. He did the full and complete sacrifice on the cross. He took on the powers of sin and death and darkness, and he's victorious. So unlike other battles where we, we can see the battle, but we don't know what the outcome of that battle will be, this battle, the outcome is sure in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in the meantime, while we have to battle, we, are, we have got weapons and strategy from the creator of heaven and earth to enable us to be victorious in that battle in Christ Jesus. Jesus didn't say, okay, kids, I'm out of here now. I'm going to heaven. It's a jungle out there. Duck and dive the bullets. Hope you make it. If you do make it, I'll see you up there. That's not what Jesus said at all. We are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. Huge difference. Amen. Amen. I'll say that again. We are not fighting for victory. Jesus has the victory. We are fighting from the position of victory. And there's a battle plan for us in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, which reads as follows. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power, divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, to obey Christ. The word destroy, I actually looked it up and it's defined as um, end, to end the existence of something by damaging or attacking it. So these weapons that we have, they're not puny little handguns or anything like that. They are mighty because they are backed by the divine power of God, who is the creator of heaven and earth. His power is matchless. The enemy is not a match for God. There's nothing in the universe that is a match for God. His power is matchless. So when he gives us these spiritual weapons, these weapons are able to destroy harmful arguments and to take captive thoughts that, that to make those thoughts obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and to who He is and to His authority and His truth. The Greek word in this scripture for um, captive actually means spear. So that's a weapon, a spear. So when the enemy brings these thoughts, these minefields that he wants to plant, these lies and deception, Wow, when we take this, this verse, when we make war with it against the enemy, we spear that thought or that lie or that thing that the enemy, that thought that the enemy wants to bring. And to obey in the Greek here means to respond or to pay attention attention to what someone is saying. Isn't that wonderful? We say, no, enemy, I'm putting a spear through this according to the word of God. And what I'm telling you is to pay attention to the word and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what happens when we, when we, um, when we take this battle strategy. When the Lord Jesus had been baptized, he went into the Judean desert and he spent 40 days in fasting and prayer and just hearing God and it was preparation for his ministry. So the enemy went along to him as well and tried the same thing. The enemy went to Jesus to try his mind stuff, to play his mind games. And he says he doesn't go well, hi, Jesus, you are the son of God, so you're hungry, so just turn these stones into bread. He doesn't go like that. He goes, if you are, 
if you are the son of God. And with that little word, what does he want to do? He wants to make Jesus doubt who he is. If Jesus doubts who he is, he doubts who God is, there's, if, we, if we start on that route, if we allow the enemy to come against our identity, it effect, affects a whole lot of other areas. So the enemy wanted, if it were at all possible, to get Jesus with mind games, leading him eventually to jump off the mountain, and you can go and read in Matthew 4, to self-destruct if that were possible. But it wasn't because Jesus took the spear and he speared the thoughts that the enemy wanted to bring. And each time he told the enemy, it is written. It is a certain thing. It is the truth. The truth stands there. God has said, it is written written and he took the the thoughts of the enemy completely captive with the truth of God our human willpower or efforts will not help us to win the battle that the enemy wants to wage against our minds we need the battle strategies and the authority of the Lord. Because James um, 4, 7 also says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will. So the authority and the effectiveness of our spiritual weapons are not because of who we are. They are because of our submission to God and our relationship with God that gives us the authority to resist the devil and then lets him flee from us. Not he, he'll sometimes flee, he'll flee like seven out of ten times. No, he will flee each and every time. So the strategies that God gives us um, in the Word, we're going to look at a few strategies that we have as part of this battle. And the, the first one is renewing our minds by knowing and, and, and memorizing Scripture. When we grow up, and there are various reasons for that, that we People say things about us, different things happen to us, traumatic things, we are victimized in situations, and those things are, are not the will of God. It's people abusing the free will that God has given them, and they will be accountable to God. But a neural pathway is like walking the same route through the felt every day. The first time you go down that route, you're sort of treading out the path. By, you, by going over it the fifth, fifth time, there's a reasonable path established. And then eventually, you don't even have to tread the path out or think you just walk automatically. So if we have been... Uh, over a long time, thoughts have been um, spoken over us or planted in us through other people by the enemy that goes like, oh, you're never going to make it. You're such a failure. You're not good enough. You call yourself a Christian, da-da-da. So there's a neural pathway in the brain that goes like that. And we just want to go. When the next thought of the enemy comes, we just want to go down that same route. Yet the most amazing and wonderful and, and, and marvelous thing is that we can form new neural pathways. When we renew our minds and study the Word of God, then the brain has the ability to form a new neural pathway that consists of the truth of God's Word. And the new path can be something like, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am, uh, um, God's plans that He has for me are for good and not for evil, to give me a future and a hope. God has numbered the hairs on my head. God's thoughts toward me outnumber the grains of sea, of sand at the sea. So we can form new neural pathways. The idea is not that we just remove all the negative stuff that the enemy has planted there on our path, but that we actually replace those 
those minds. We replace and we, there's a new neural pathway which is full of the truth of God. It's like our brains are the hardware, but our minds over years may have been programmed with the wrong software. And so we, we get a new software from the Word of God. It's the truth. Yeah, I wrote you in my notes that we all know Microsoft and it's great and we use it. But I think if we had to name the program, the software of the enemy, we can call it macro lies. So do not allow your mind to be programmed by, by macro lies. Um, Romans 12 verse 2 tells us, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. The Greek word there is the word where we get our word metamorphosis. It's literally the caterpillar turning into a butterfly by the renewal of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to approve what God's will is because your mind is renewed. You know what the truth is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Battle strategy number two is that we use God's word as a spiritual weapon. And we even find our battle dress in Ephesians 6, the armor of God. Many of you may know it very well. And we don't have time. The, the armor of God is a message in itself. But we are just quickly going to look at the armor and at the different weapons. So Ephesians 6, 10 to 8 says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Again, it's the power of God that makes us strong. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. God is saying, my children, here's your battle dress. Put it on, and if you do, you will be able to stand your ground when the enemy comes at you. So the first thing there is the belt of truth. The belt of truth buckled around your waist. We all know that a belt is, is around our core area and that it acts like a, like a reinforcement. And in the case of Roman soldiers, other weapons would hang from the belt. So the belt had to be strong. So you and I, when we do this in the spirit, what is protecting our core is the truth, the truth of God's word. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So in Jesus, the belt of truth for us means that Jesus is our core. Jesus is the center. We are strengthened in the core of our being by knowing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And then it speaks about the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate covered vital organs, including the heart. So the enemy will go from the mind, wanting it, the thought to take hold of the mind, and then proceed to the heart. Whereas we can put the breastplate of our righteousness, our right standing with God through Christ Jesus, over our hearts. So when the enemy comes and he wants to condemn and he wants to accuse and he wants to rob us of our joy or of our peace, we say, no, I am righteous in Christ Jesus. And that righteousness covers and protects my heart. And then there are, the, we have our feet fitted with, a re, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Roman soldiers had what is called a cleat. So I looked that up as well. It's like a T-shaped piece of metal or wood underneath a shoe that would anchor the shoe firmly. So no matter what the terrain, that cleat would cause the Roman soldier to stand and to hold his ground. 
So now that we know that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, our feet, there's a cleat underneath our feet that is the peace of God, that Jesus is our peace. He is our shalom, and we can stand our ground when the enemy comes. Then this um, Ephesians 6 tells us about the shield of faith with which we can extinguish the fiery darts that the enemy brings. In the case of Romans, Roman soldiers, the, the shield covered the whole body. It covered the whole body. It was actually quite big. It's a full body shield. So when we know that faith makes is a covering for us. Our faith in God is a shield that protects us, that covers us against the enemy. It is able to extinguish any fiery dart that the enemy brings and, and aims at us. We have faith in God. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. So I believe that when we study the word of God, when we meditate on the word of God, when we hear the word of God, we are in a way always strengthening the shield, you know, making it maybe thicker or more powerful or however you would like to see that. But our faith in Jesus is a complete covering for us against the darts and the arrows of the enemy. And then the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. A helmet obviously covered the head because when you take somebody's head off, you've actually taken them out, they are gone. So the enemy wants to get inside our minds as we've just seen. But we can be sure of our salvation in Christ. And that can be a sure thing in our minds that we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that goes from our heads, from protecting our minds into our hearts where we can be sure and at peace with God that we have been saved um, through Jesus Christ. I love this verse and I know it, but, but looking it up this time just added an extra nuance for me. And that is Corinthians 2 verse 16. It tells us that we have the mind of Christ. We can tell the enemy we have the mind of Christ. And then that same verse says that we hold the thoughts and the purposes of his heart in our minds. Isn't that just amazing? And what are God and Jesus' thoughts and purposes for us to save us, to redeem us, to give us eternal life? He's got plans for us. So when we tell the enemy, I have the mind of Christ, and in that mind I hold the thoughts and the purposes that Christ has for me. Hebrews 4 tells us that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. So we use it as an offensive weapon. All these other weapons are there to protect us and to shield us. But we can take the word of God and use it as an offensive weapon. The way that Jesus did, it is written. And then Ephesians 6 says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Prayer is an extremely powerful weapon. I sometimes chide and rebuke myself and I repent before God because of saying something like, well, we've done this, 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 and this. All we can do now is pray. And then I think, what are you saying? Lord, please forgive me. And I know why we say that, and I know how we mean that. But for myself, I think, how can you say all that we can do? Because the first thing is prayer. And it's a very powerful thing because we are praying to the God of the universe who says that he hears us and he's waiting to show himself active on our behalf. So it's not like, 
all I can do is pray, God. No, when we pray, it's an incredibly powerful spiritual weapon. So here's a very powerful statement. God wants us dressed for battle by wearing truth, wielding truth, living truth, believing truth, and praying truth. And our, our third and last battle strategy, which I think as Christians we sometimes don't understand enough or maybe don't apply strongly enough or think, yeah, for other people, but not for me. Um, and that is that we need to know and use our authority in Christ. Jesus said in Luke 10, 19 to his disciples, that's you and me. I have given you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions, which is symbolic of demonic entities, and over all the power of the enemy. Ephesians 2, 6 says that we are seated with the Lord Jesus in heavenly places. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. It's a position of authority. He's seated there. He's firm. And we, according to the word, are seated with him. We're not going to be seated there. We're not looking for a seat and standing around right now. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And we can use um, that authority. You know, when somebody gives you power of attorney, it's a legal document and it's a piece of paper. And it can lie there. And it can lie there until you go to heaven. It's only when we take authority and we use it. And that is what the Lord wants us to do, to use the authority that is given us over um, the games of the enemy. Uh, and just before we close, the Lord laid on my heart that, that we really need to be aware of not having a victim mentality and not allowing the enemy um, to plant thoughts in our mind that we see ourselves as victims. Now, we don't mean to undermine in any way the times in your life and in my life where we have been victims and we had no control over that. So yes, there are terrible and traumatic things that happen to us and we are victims. But the enemy will want us to adopt that victim stance for it even to have an oppression in our spirit, which we call a victim spirit. And God knows of the situations where we were victimized and God will, will, will bring whoever it was to account. But if we adopt a victim mentality, we're going to have a very tough struggle here on earth because we are just sitting in that victim mentality. It is said that our lives are made up of two percentages, a 90% and a 10%. 10% is the terrible things that happen to us where we are victims. And 90% is how we decide to let the enemy use that and how we allow him to let us see ourselves as victims and how that then would have an impact on our lives. We are not victims we are victors in Christ. And we can live from that victorious position. And God will heal and set us free and help us deal with the times when we were victims. But in Christ, we cannot remain victims. We choose to be victors in Christ Jesus' victory. So I close with a quote from Corrie ten Boom. Uh, Mike and I have recently been using a devotional written by Corrie ten Boom 
if you don't know who Corrie ten Boom is, she long, long ago, she's already gone to be with the Lord at the good old age of 91. Um, she um, is, was born in the Netherlands. And um, during World War II, when the Nazis um, killed the Jews, Corrie ten Boom and her family hid Jews in their home. And they saved the lives of 800 people approximately. And then somebody ratted on the family and they were found out and they were taken to concentration camps and her family was killed and her sister was also eventually killed. But if you read about the faith of Corrie ten Boom, she was imprisoned in Nazi camps four times. She spent in four different prisons. She spent four months in solitary confinement where they, the, the bread, her one piece of bread that she got per day was just thrown into the solitary confinement cell. Now in my thinking, and she writes about that, your mind, what does your mind tell you in circumstances like that? It was terrible. It was unthinkable what those people went through. And yet, Corrie ten Boom, she retained her faith. And when eventually she got uh, out of the prison, she went on to have a ministry throughout the world that was so powerful because she did not allow the enemy to take hold of her mind, even in those circumstances which we find unthinkable. It's sometimes tough out there, I know that, believe me. It is tough out there. But is it ever for us as tough as the Lord Jesus who had to full on face the power of sin and death and darkness and hell? Is it ever as tough as that for us? No, because only Jesus took that on and He was victorious. And because He took that on, we don't have to take it on to that extent. Jesus took it to the full extent. So this is what Corrie ten Boom says. Faith brings the unreality of hope to the reality of now. Hope is the future. Faith is the present. Faith is the radar that shows us the reality of God's victory. Jesus was victor. Jesus is victor. Jesus will be victor. And now His victory has become ours. Jesus has triumphed and nothing could ever separate us from His love. Hallelujah and Amen. Let's, let's pray. Father, we, Lord, what words could we use, God, that would remotely describe who you are and who our Savior Jesus Christ is? Lord, we bow our hearts, our minds, our very beings before you, God, Jesus. You are victorious. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then, Jesus, you say that you have gone to prepare a place for us. And, Jesus, you say that we are seated with you in heavenly places. Lord Jesus, thank you. Lord Jesus, we offer you our worship and our praise and our hearts, God. You're so worthy, Jesus. You're so worthy to be honored and to receive all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Thank you, Jesus, that you didn't leave us as orphans or victims, but that you armed us, Jesus,
that you armed us with the powerful, divine, mighty weapons of our God, who is the creator of the universe. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your victory. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the weapons that you have given us, Jesus. Most of all, thank you that you say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you are here this morning and you, 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 you are not free, you don't have the peace of God, you are not sure that you are saved through the blood and the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want to leave without giving you an opportunity as the Lord speaks to your heart to surrender your life to Christ. So let's all pray this prayer together in agreement with those people here or online who may um, be wanting to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you are my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, that I have eternal life in you. I surrender my life to you, Jesus. Be the king of my life. And Lord, make me into the person that you have created and destined me to be. I pray it in your precious name, Jesus. Amen and amen.